Dobro dnia, Kiew. Jak sprawi? <laughs> good afternoon, or good evening, or hello, um, or привет, if you, that's your thing. Uh, yes, my name is Dylan Beatty, and uh, I am here to talk to you this afternoon about something that I call happy code. Uh, this is me. I've been building websites since 1992, so I've been basically building web applications for as long as the web has existed. Um, I'm a CTO at a Skills Matter in London. I'm a Microsoft MVP. I run a .NET user group. I do all kinds of things. Um, one thing that I do not do is a rozmawiają ukraińsku. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, there's the site Duolingo. Does anybody know Duolingo? Which is like a language learning thing you can use on your phone. Um, so I figured I should try and learn just a little bit. Um, and Duolingo taught me some very, very useful things. Tsinakava, tse borscht. Projekt zatrumajace tomu ešte architektor piany. My kit programist, ale więc najlepsze Java. So I'm. Dziękuję. <laughs> so I'm going to talk to you in English this evening, if that's all right with you. Now, a lot of the ideas that I'm going to talk about in this talk tonight uh, came out of. I spent a long time working at a company in London called Spotlight who uh, I ran their software team for about 15 years. And Spotlight is a theater company. They are like LinkedIn for professional actors who work in film and television. And because we do theater, whenever we talked with an agency and they did a presentation, they'd always use this art, this slide, as the first thing in, in their deck, the Greek theater masks of happiness and sadness, comedy and tragedy. And this sort of started me thinking, because something that I've noticed over a lot of projects that I've worked on is projects where the developers are happy normally deliver good software. And projects where the developers are unhappy often don't deliver good software. You know, sometimes you have a project that you think it's going to be a disaster. Um, it's really difficult. You have no budget. You've got complicated integration. And then after a couple of weeks, everyone's kind of excited, and they're coming to work, and they're like, this is good. We're doing good stuff. You know, say horosho. And then you have other projects where it should be amazing. You've got a good, interesting opportunity and a lot of budget and good tools. And just after a few weeks, everyone is like, I don't want to go to work. I'm miserable. I don't like my job. And I wondered, what can we do to try and make development teams, make it a happier process, happier thing for us to do? The other thing that I'm talking to you about tonight is something called discovery, discoverability, which is, it comes from educational psychology. It is a way of learning about things by exploring them. If you have something like a software system or a puzzle or a game, you learn better if you can kind of get inside that system and you can play around with it. And you can solve problems for yourself. You don't have to read a manual. You can try things and see what they do, like a sandbox. And the interesting thing about this is we learn better when we solve puzzles. There is this, this chemical in the human brain. It's called dopamine. And it is a neurotransmitter. And when you win at cards, dopamine. When you do drugs, dopamine. When you get drunk, dopamine. When you solve puzzles, dopamine. You get this rush. And one, this can get you hooked. You ever stayed up programming all night? And you're like, I'll finish this, and then I'll go to bed. And then you know, oh, one more test, one more thing, one more thing, I'll just fix this. And then it is 4 o'clock in the morning and you've been up all night. Because you just keep going one more, one more, one more, because you're getting this little rush. And your brain is going, yes, you did it, do another one. But this chemical actually makes us better at learning. We remember things better. We learn things, we can use the knowledge more effectively. So if we can create software that people can learn as if they are solving puzzles. They will learn it faster. They will enjoy working with it. They will become more productive. I think that sounds pretty good. Let's have a look at some of the things that we can try and do in order to do this. Now, I want to talk to you about something we call learning curves. These are two learning curves. There is a blue one here and a red one. And we have this expression in English. We talk about a very steep learning curve or a very shallow learning curve. So uh, just a quick poll. By show of hands, who thinks that the red curve here is better? 
Who thinks the blue curve is better? Who thinks the question is stupid? <laughs> There's no such thing as better or worse, okay? One of these, the, the blue curve here, somebody has worked very hard and they have learned a lot very quickly. The red curve here is somebody who's not worked very hard and it's taken them a long time. You know, this is, this is kind of fine. The blue one is that person on your team, they go home at the weekend and they learn Haskell and they come in on Monday and you're like, did you learn Haskell in a weekend? They went, yeah, I read the manual, it's not that hard. And you know, they've worked a weekend. And then the red one is that person who, you know, it's 10 years and they still don't know how to do page breaks in Word. So they go return, return, return to get to the next page. You know, some people learn faster than other people, this is fine. What you wanna look out for is learning curves that look like this. Because this thing here, this is called a localized peak. Has anybody here done ASP.NET web forms? Yeah. So when web forms first came out in about 2002, it was really cool because you had this toolbox with buttons and data grids and you could drag them onto a web page and write code and it looked really good in the demos and everyone thought this was really amazing. And you know, you learn web forms. I spent a couple of years learning how to do all this stuff, you know, on item data bound and on click. And then one day my boss says to me, our client wants a streaming video server, like they can pause and resume video. And I go and I look in the toolbox and there's no streaming video component. <laughs> I'm like, so I start researching what I need and I'm like, there's all this stuff, they lied to me. The web does not use on click. The web is request response. The web has HTTP headers. All of the stuff that I have learned with web forms, they're lying, it doesn't work. I need to throw it away and I need to start again. And I've got to this localized peak and now I'm down here and I'm going home at the end of the week and I'm miserable. I'm like, Ugh, I hate web forms, I hate my job, I don't want to do this anymore. That's what we want to avoid. And so we want to look out for these, these localized peaks where there's abstractions, and when you get to a certain level, the abstraction turns out to be completely wrong. Now, the other important thing we want to look out for, I'm gonna teach you how to draw an owl, okay? So step one is you draw an oval for the head. And then step two, an oval for the body. And then step three, we draw the rest of the owl, yeah? <laughs> now, we get, this is from Reddit, there's a whole Reddit about these, these kind of jokes, but you get this in software documentation all the time. You know, like, how do you add a, a local SSH key to GitHub? Oh, go here, download this file, and now simply add it to your local configuration keychain. And you're like, I, I don't know what that is. What we've got here is a learning curve that looks like this, except this brick wall in the middle, that may as well not be there. We've got two completely separate processes. We've got kind of beginners and we've got advanced. And no one has told us how to get from being a beginner to being advanced. And this is a dead end, this is a brick wall. You get to the top of the beginner and you're like, I'm stuck. I literally, I cannot solve this puzzle. I'm not gonna get the little dopamine rush. I'm not gonna enjoy using the software. I'm gonna go home because I'm upset. Now, about 10 years ago, has anyone worked with Castle Windsor? few of you. It's, it's Castle Windsor was very, very cool around the first wave of alt.net when we first started doing dependency injection with .net. And uh, this is before Stack Overflow and stuff. So we used to do everything with blog posts. And the first time I ever downloaded Castle Windsor, I installed the DLLs and I set up a project and I ran it. And the first time I ran it, I got this. And I was like, okay, didn't work. Yellow screen of death. And then I thought, hang on, look at this error message here. So one server error in application, we've all seen that a million times. And then it says, looks like you forgot to register the HTTP module. That's so friendly. It's not, you're an idiot, you're wrong. It's like, looks like you forgot. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I forgot. That's, <laughs> I, I know what I'm doing. And then it says to fix this, and it gives you this little snippet of XML right there inside the error message. And you copy that, and you paste it, and you press refresh, and it works. And you think, wow, I solved the puzzle, I'm really smart. And your brain gives you this little hit. And you think, I love Castle Microkernel, it's brilliant because the people who built it wanted me to have a good time. And they noticed this. And somebody at the Castle team was like, everyone who downloads this project, they always get stuck at this point. Why don't we put the answer in the error message so they don't have to look it up? Now, <clears throat> there's this term we have in, in software called user experience, right? And Often you'll see like, oh, well, we have a user experience team, or we have an engineer who does user experience. And so the rest of us think it's not our problem because they do user experience and we do databases, or we do backend, or we do class libraries. But actually that's not true. 
all of us, if you write software, you are creating a user experience. If I make an API and I give it to you so you can build a mobile application, you're the user of the code that I built. If I build a database and you have to run a report or configure some ORMs or something, I'm the engineer, you are the user of the thing that I built. And all of us are always creating these user experiences. And once you think about that, it changes the way we think about a lot of the things that we do. OK, let's look at an example. We're going to get a new job. We're going to go and work in this amazing hotshot startup web agency company. And we go in on Monday morning, and they say, yeah, welcome. Here's the company. Look, there's the coffee machine, and the bathrooms are there. And sit you down at your desk, and they say, right, get the website up and running locally. That's your first task. And you go, OK, I can do this. You go onto GitHub, and you start poking around. There's a repository. It's called Website. You think, OK. And you clone it, and it's empty. There's no files. You're like, OK, website. Ah, oh, website 2019. Maybe that's it. So you clone that one. There's nothing in there. You look, oh, website final. You clone that. There's nothing. And so you turn to your new coworker, and you say, hey, Sasha. And Sasha, headphones come off. Like, what? Like, where's the website code? Sasha says, ah, oh, website code is in a repository called sales. And you're like, why? So it used to be the sales website. And so, so you clone the sales repository, and, and you run it. And the build fails because it can't find the DLLs. It can't find mycompany.financial.dll. And you Google it, but you know, no one on the internet's ever heard of this. So you turn to Sasha again, and you say, Sasha, headphones come off. What? Have you got the DLLs? Oh, yeah, I'll share my C drive. Right click everyone, full control. Just you know, get whatever you need. So you get all the DLLs, and you drop them in, and, and, you know, and maybe eventually you get the code up and running. But it's day one. You haven't achieved anything. You're a bit frustrated. Sasha hates you now, because they've been trying to work all day. Um, if you're unlucky, you just get this. Now, this is a real error message that somebody at Microsoft got paid to write. <laughs> Unspecified error. It's like, well, you know what went wrong. I don't know. I was just trying to install something. You know, you get these, these dead ends, these brick walls, bad user experience, unhappy developers. That project is not going to ship good quality software. So you quit. And you go across the street, and you work for another hotshot web agency startup. And you go in on the first day, and they say, hey, welcome. And you go, oh, hey, Sasha, because Sasha also quit. And there's the coffee, and there's the toilets, and here's your laptop and your password. And they say, oh, get the website running locally. Um, and just as you're sitting down, Sasha says, oh, hey, the website, uh, the project code name is Applejack. And you go, OK. Go into GitHub, Applejack. Clone it. There it is. It's cool. You push build. And the first thing you notice, it comes up restoring NuGet packages. And it's restoring from nuget.mycompany.com. And you think, that's really clever. Somebody's taken all the weird DLLs, and they've made an internal NuGet feed for it. And then the system boots up, and you get a screen saying, hey, you know, welcome. It looks like you're running our website for the first time. Uh, you don't have a database. You'll need one. Go and look in the Applejack repo that you just cloned, and there's a folder in there called SQL. And you go and look in SQL, you'll find all the data definition scripts. So you go in there, and you run those, and you get the database. And this is brilliant. You know, you've been at work for three hours. You haven't had to bother anyone. You've solved all these things yourself. You're like, this is great. This afternoon, it's my first day, and I can ship some code and fix bugs this afternoon. Um, and Sasha says, hey, you want to go and get a cup of coffee? And as you're walking to the kitchen, you say, why is it called Applejack? And Sasha says, oh, we, just, we name everything after ponies. And you're like, what? And he says, yeah, we just need names. You know, they're project code names. They don't, they don't matter. We don't show the customers. But we have you know, Applejack, and we have Shutterfly, and we have Buttercandy, and we have all the different code names. And that's just what we call our projects. Naming is a really, really powerful pattern for making software more discoverable. Because once you've done this, you have a project called Applejack. OK, now you know what to call it in GitHub. Now you know what to call it in your log files and log entries. Now you know what to call it in the wiki. If you want to send email notifications, you can send them from Applejack at company. And then you can look in your inbox. You can be like, OK, I can see what's going on here. When you're doing you know, architectural diagrams and planning, you can just put the names on a board and start thinking of software design in terms of conversations between these different components. It's a really, really powerful pattern to help people understand where the boundaries are between different systems and to make it easy to work out what a particular system is for, what is it doing, where is the code, where is the documentation. All right. 
Let's have a little history lesson. This was the first computer I ever programmed on. It's 286 PC, 16 megahertz. It had a megabyte of RAM, one megabyte. And I'd wanted this for so long. Like, you know, I was hassling, Dad, Dad, can we get a computer? And eventually we got a computer, and I switch it on, and it says, A. And I go, hello. And it says, bad command or file name. And I'm like, whoa, you know, I, uh, maybe there's a menu. Bad command or file name. Help. Bad command or file name. You know, this literally, the first experience of MS-DOS was a dead end. You switched it on, A, and you're like, I don't know. <laughs> I guess I better read the manual, which was this thick and was really not a good book at all. Now, the other computer that was around at this sort of time, the early 1990s, when you switched that on, it did this. It gave you a little smiley face with a computer picture. And it booted, it said, welcome to Macintosh. And then, after it clicked away for a few seconds, it would come up with a desktop screen that looked like this. And you'd be like, okay, so I can move this thing around. And then you start going, right, these things here I can click on. File, edit, view, label. I wonder what these do. Let me click on file. OK, there's some stuff under there. This thing down here looks like a trash can. Maybe there's, I can throw files away there. You know, it started creating this metaphor of a discoverable system. It's not the MS-DOS black wall of death. It's, look, here are some things. You can click on these things. You can learn the system by discovering it and exploring it. Now, this was a really, really powerful and successful idea. The problem that we had is lots of people went, well, if DOS is bad and this is good, clearly we can make our product better by putting everything on the screen at the same time. <laughs> Which is not the answer. You know, what you need to do, this is Visual Studio 2017 with all of the menus switched on. You see, it's easy. You just, you type your program here and <laughs> that's how you'd become a professional software developer. Um, but the problem with this is this kind of interface doesn't anticipate the journey that your user is going on. You're going, hey, you're a developer. Bang. There. Everything. Now, .NET devs know that the debug thing at the top, we click that about 100 times a day. The UML model inspector, nobody has ever used that, ever. Like, I don't even know what it does. But in this interface, these things are both on the screen in front of you. You're supposed to know what's important and what's not. What we want to try and do is to create interfaces, user interfaces, programming interfaces that will help the user learn how your system works. Now, my favorite example of this from any piece of software ever is here. Good morning. You have been in suspension for 50 days. In compliance with state and federal regulations, all testing candidates in the Aperture Science Extended Relaxation Center must be revived periodically for a mandatory physical and mental wellness exercise. You will hear a buzzer. When you hear the buzzer, look up at the ceiling. Good. You will hear a buzzer. When you hear the buzzer, look down at the floor. Good. This completes the gymnastic portion of your mandatory physical and mental wellness exercise. There is a framed painting on the wall. Please go stand in front of it. This is art. You will hear a buzzer. When you hear the buzzer, stare at the art. You should now feel mentally reinvigorated. If you suspect staring at art has not provided the required intellectual sustenance, reflect briefly on this classical music. Now, please return to your bed. So that's the intro level of Portal 2, which is a game where you do not have to read the manual. You start playing the game, and it literally teaches you how to look around, and it teaches you how to move, and it teaches you how to interact with the, the game world. So there's no kind of learning step. Right from the beginning, you're playing the game. You're exploring the story. You're learning it for yourself. And I love that game. I thought it was fantastic. Let's look at an example which is a bit more relevant to uh, sort of professional software development. So this is Microsoft Edge, the amazing browser that was going to kill Internet Explorer and everything. And the first time you run Microsoft Edge, you think, I should check this out. It might be important, you know. And you go in, and you're like, OK, this looks pretty good. There's Google. Right, where's my stuff? Right click, and you're like, what? I'm a web developer. 
I need my tools. What is this select all and print stuff? And then you start thinking, hang on a second, what's this menu up here? And you go over there and you notice that there's an option called F12 developer tools. And because you're smart, you notice nothing else on here has got an F number next to it. So when you think, OK, F12, developer tools, maybe if I press F12, I get developer tools. This is pretty cool. Then you switch it on, and it says, inspect element and view source will now appear in the context menu. I was so impressed when I saw that. Because for 99% of users, they don't need inspect element and view source. This is when your mum phones you and goes, I've broken the internet. Facebook's broken in half, and the codes are leaking out, you know? And you're like, no, mom, it's all right. Just, just, just shut it down. Um, and so what Microsoft have done is they said, well, people who go looking for this will make it easy, but we'll keep it hidden for everybody else so they don't stumble across it by mistake. Now, we can use similar sorts of ideas in all sorts of places in the software we develop. I'm sure all of you are familiar with IntelliSense, intelligent code completion. Console dot, and you press the dot, and it just brings up a list of stuff. So you don't need to remember anything ever again. Just every time you get stuck, you press dot, and it'll give you all of the options that are available there. And this is a really powerful way. You know, modern class libraries are huge and have so many different methods and properties they expose that things like this are really, really useful for being able to work effectively with them. But how many of you have ever actually written your own intelligent code completion hints? Because we all rely on them when we're working with other people's code. Now, I've been doing .NET development since 2002, and I cannot remember how to write connection strings. I just can't do it. It's one of the things we all do all the time, and I can never remember the syntax. So I built this little helper method. And what this does, I go var SQL equals new SQL connection, and it tells me I need a connection string but it doesn't tell me what that looks like. So I stop, and I alt-tab, and I go and look on connectionstrings.com, and then I see that I've got email, and then, you know, that's it. You're out of the zone. So I built sql.connect, and when you type this, it gives you the syntax right there in the message that pops up. And it stays there just long enough that you're like, oh, yeah, I remember. It's the server, and then the database user ID has a space in it, password, done, finished. And as soon as you close the bracket, it goes away. It, that hint helps you for just the exact amount of time that you're stuck. And doing it's really, really easy, because if you go and look at the definition of this method, there's just the special XML that's embedded in the code, which pops up on the screen at the moment where you get stuck. Now, these kinds of patterns work really, really well if you know what the user is probably trying to do next. But what if you don't know what they're trying to do? What if there's like half a dozen, you know, 10, 15 different options they could use, and you want to help them explore the system? <coughs> We're going to talk about something that's known in uh, user experience and product design, signposting. Signposting is basically putting labels on things saying, you can go here. You can do this. These things are available to you at this point in your, your user journey. Now, a few years back, I built a uh, hypermedia, a REST API for Spotlight, which exposed a whole bunch of capabilities for adding actors to the system and removing them and updating them. And the team I was working with, we started out building this little tool as a internal diagnostic, just something that we played with and we used to test our own code. And this thing got so useful, we actually ended up shipping it. So this is a little JavaScript layer that runs on top of that API. But the API that sits underneath it uses hypermedia. So it's a full RESTful API, as in it shows you links that tell you what you can do as you're working with it. So this thing, one, we've said, look, we've got a discovery endpoint, which is like a home page for an API. And we've got a sandbox and a live environment. So you can trivially switch between things. And then you can, using this tool, literally click around the data structures that the API exposes and see what's in there. You don't have to read the manual. You can just explore it. And then we started exposing actions. So as well as just kind of clicking and getting resources and clicking and getting resources, we've got this option in here. We're going to go into one of these performer profiles. And we can see that there is a delete method and an update method. Now, those are only there because we have permission to do that. But we can invoke one of those directly in this tool. We can hit Submit, and there we go. That change has been reflected in the system immediately. Now, the brilliant thing about this is the number of times we'd get support calls from someone who'd then go, no, it's all right. I tried it in the Explorer, and I can see what I did wrong. It's a really, really powerful way. It's much nicer than saying, here is our API documentation. 
you know, we do have documentation to go with it. But for somebody just wanting to try out whether a certain operation is possible, giving them this kind of tool that's plugged directly into a sandbox and uses these hypermedia actions and methods and links to tell you how you can navigate around it was such a powerful solution. It really was. Now, we've talked so far about building software where you're creating some code and then your, your users are other developers who are working with your system to create more software. What about the people who are supporting your software? What about operations engineers? What about help desk? What about someone else has gone on holiday and you're in charge and their system blows up? So I want to talk a little bit about the whole idea of monitoring and metrics and what it's like when software is running in production. You get into work one morning and the phone is ringing. And the phone ringing is bad, because the phone only rings when email and Slack are both not working. So you answer the phone, and somebody says, the system is broken. And you say, I'm terribly sorry. Uh, what's the problem? They're like, it just doesn't work. OK, I've just got in here. Let me take your number. I'll investigate. I'll give you a call back. And you hang the phone up, and it rings again, and you pick it up again. And someone says, the whole system's broken. The website's down, and the internet's broken. It's your fault. You broke it. And you're like, I literally just got to work. Here, let me take your number and everything. And after you know, five or 10 of these calls, you finally get someone who goes, hey, the system's broken. Do you want me to send you a screenshot? And you go, yes. Please, show me. Show me what you've got. And they send you this. And they're like, can you tell what it is? And you're like, yeah. It's, a, it's a, this, this error here. Um, and then your boss gets in and says, what's wrong with the system? And you're like, request timed out. And the boss says, well, how long is it going to take to fix it? And you say, well, we've got about 180,000 lines of code in production. I can probably check one of them every five minutes. So I don't know, maybe this afternoon, maybe six months, who knows. So all the customers are angry, and the users are angry, and the boss is angry, and they're all angry with you, and you're angry with them because this isn't your fault, and everyone's angry with the person who went on holiday, and you probably hate the person who wrote the code in the first place, and everybody's angry with everybody, and nothing is getting fixed. This is bad, by the way. This is you know, we, th what we want to avoid. So let's do the same thing, but now we're in the new company that we went to work for. And you get in in the morning. The phone isn't ringing, but there is a dashboard on the wall, big screen TV with a bunch of green tiles on it. And each one of these tiles represents one of your kind of high-level systems. These are the things that get named after My Little Ponies, if that's how you're doing stuff. And you come in this morning, and you go, oh, hang on a second. This is not good. We got three reds on production. What's going on? And just from looking at that screen, you're like, OK, well, the content delivery network is down. The intranet is down, and the main website is down. I'm going to look at the content delivery network first, because that sounds like it's probably important, and the other two are depending on it. And you know, before, maybe even before anybody else has noticed, you're like, hey, uh, could you tell everyone we're having a bit of an incident? Looks like we've got problems with production. Um, tell them there'll be an update in 15 minutes. Can you go and check what's going on with the CDN? Uh, you check the web stack. You check the internet logs. I'm going to go and make everyone coffee. And you come back in five minutes, and someone says, yep, the certificate on the CDN expired. Again, like it does every year, again. Um, <laughs> How could we have ever seen that coming? You know, um, And so you renew the certificate, and everything's back up. And just by having that dashboard view, you know, you're proactive here. You're the ones who tell other people, look, there might be a problem. Please you know, bear with us while we fix it. One of the amazing things that I never realized when we built our first, I mean, this, this is a real photograph of the, the um, IT team wall at Spotlight. And people would look at this wall, and they'd see the red, and they'd be like, is everything OK? Can I help? Do you want, can, I, can I get coffee? Do you need someone to go and get sandwiches? Um, you know, People coming around to like collect for birthdays or anything would come back later because they could see you were busy. And it just completely changed the way people think about it. And on the days when this is green, it reminds everybody that their engineers are doing a good job, the system is working, and everything's fine. And it's not magic. It's people actually working on it. You know, It had this sort of wonderful effect of making everyone feel like part of the same team when it came to running systems. Now, you know, monitoring systems, are, it's a little bit like building user interfaces. You do not want to take every single thing that runs anywhere in your stack and put all of them on a monitor. It'll look like this. You are not allowed to play with this until you've trained with NASA for 20 years. This is the flight deck of the Space Shuttle Endeavor. What you want is this kind of dashboard that you can look at. And if any of these lights come on, you're like, OK, one, I know we have a problem. Two, I know where to start looking. Three, I sort of have a vague idea which part of the system might be causing this problem and whether it's safe to continue operating or not. You know, If you get in your car and it says it's low on fuel, 
you go and put petrol in. If you get in your car, it says there's a problem with the brakes, you think, hmm, maybe I'll take the bus today. You know, you want that kind of decision making. Now, one of the other things I love, these dashboards are, are brilliant for monitoring systems from the outside. But we can also, if we're creating our own systems, we can expose the behavior in ways that makes it easier to see what they're doing. This is the engine room of the Star Trek, uh, Starship Enterprise from Star Trek Next Generation. And I, I love this show. I grew up watching this. And I always loved the fact that the engine was part of the set, this big blue glowing thing in the background. And you know, whenever they had a scene down here, you'd see it in the background. And if you ever watched an episode where this thing wasn't lit up, you knew there was a problem immediately. Like suddenly, one day you're watching TV, now you're part of the Starship Enterprise engineering team. You're like, there's a problem, the warp engine is down. Clearly, this is gonna be the plot of, of today's episode. Because it creates transparency. They didn't hide the engine behind a panel or something, they put it out where you could see it. We can do the same thing in the way we built software. We can effectively allow our engineering team to look into the system while it's running and see what it's doing. Now, there's a framework called Nancy that I used for a lot of years to build APIs and little websites and stuff. And Nancy has a built-in dashboard solution, which is absolutely brilliant. You configure a password in your application config file, and then you go to slash underscore Nancy on your running system. And it gives you, is that playing? Come on. Da -da 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 -da. There we go. So you go to underscore Nancy, it gives you a running system. You go and log in here, and what it allows you to do is basically inspect live code as it is actually running. You, can, you know the code that you think shipped to production, but by doing this, you can look at it from another perspective and say, well, what does production think it's actually running? What are the routes that it thinks it's got? Which engines does it think are configured? Which model binders is it actually using? Never mind what it said in the JSON file, what's actually happening? You can go in and you can hit specific endpoints and routes and see what responses you get back off them. But the thing about this that I think is really, really powerful is it has a thing called live request tracing. So you can go into the system and you can say, OK, for the next couple of minutes, I want to switch request tracing on. I want to capture all of the requests that are going to flow through the system. And then you wait a couple of seconds, and then you go and hit request tracing, and every one of these is a real request from a real customer hitting your production system. And you can go in and see every single detail about them. You can see the headers, the responses, gateways, did it go through Nginx, all the kind of stuff which is so hard to replicate on staging or development or your local machine because of environmental differences. You switch it on for a couple of seconds, Brilliant, get all the information you need. As soon as you're done, you switch it off again, everyone gets on with their day. By creating that kind of transparency, it's a much, much easier system to work with, to diagnose, to understand. Now, all these things are brilliant for right now. This second right now, we have a problem, tell me what the problem is. That's not always good enough. We really need to understand the historical context. How did we go from everything was okay to everything has a problem? And to do that, we need to talk about logging. Now, you get into work, and there's a problem. The system is down, and you go and have a look, and you're like, I see the problem. The main database server CPU is at 100%. So, is that good? Is that bad? What's normal? What's it supposed to be? How did it get there? You need to understand the context. You need to know how it got there. Now, let's say you have a historic graph, and your CPU is doing this. You're like, OK, something here has just been increasing, getting higher and higher and higher. Maybe it looked like this. Maybe there's some, a cron job, a scheduled task, a Windows service. Maybe it's been absolutely fine until you went, yeah, come on, Sasha, let's ship it to production and go home. <laughs> and boom. <laughs> now, these three graphs tell three completely different stories. But also, how long did this take? You know. If this is 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock in one day, you're like, OK, the blue line here, we had some runaway process. We got a memory leak or something. The green line, hey, Sasha, go and check all the scheduled tasks. What's happening every hour? Are we doing log shipping or something? The red line is, oops, we shouldn't have shipped that to production. What if this is January, February, March? Same shape, same graph, but now we're talking about six months' worth of traffic. You know, The blue line is, our company's growing. We're getting more traffic, more customers, more records. 
we need more capacity, but maybe this is fine. The red line here, or the green line here, is what do we do every month? Like, first weekend of the month, we run this massive report to send to the bank or the credit card company. Maybe that's getting bigger. Maybe that's what's caused the problem. Um, the red line is probably just still you going, hey, Sasha, let's ship to production. Except now you've blown six months of uptime instead of one day. Part of the, the challenge with logging, as well as understanding this historical context, you want to know what your systems were doing, but you also want to know what the code was doing when these spikes and things start happening. And to understand that, we use logging frameworks. And logging frameworks are widely misunderstood because they all, or a lot of them have this idea of you have fatal and error and warning and info and debug. And if you're going to solve this problem across a you know, big team or multiple different software projects, you and all of the engineers you work with, you need to agree what these things mean for you so that you can put all of your logs in one place and you can make sense of the stuff that is coming out. Now, the way that I tend to work with this, fatal means this is a really big problem for the company, for the organization. Multiple users are affected now. Something is totally unresponsive. You should stop what you're doing and look into it. You know, fatal is enough to get people out of bed at night. Fatal is enough to pull people out of board meetings and say, we need to go and look at this. Now, in most companies, there will be software that is just not that important ever because it doesn't matter if it breaks on the weekend. No one's using it on the weekend. If this thing breaks on Saturday morning, you don't want to go into the office or, you know, remote in. You're like, it can wait until Monday. That's important, but it's not fatal. Fatal has a sense of urgency associated with it. Errors and warnings in software are inevitable. Networks go down. We get timeouts. We get cellular network degradation. You get collision. You get database deadlocks. Most of the time, we can build software that can cope with this. You get a database transaction deadlock? OK, wait 50 milliseconds, try again. Or just you know, tell them to reload the page. The thing about these is, because you're ignoring them when they just happen one at a time, you need to understand if something interesting happened by looking at the volume. Now, you ever ride the metro, and there's just like one person there who's like dressed up in a costume, like they're going to a party. And you're like, that's all right. It's a big city. They're going to a party. Lots of people on the metro. You ever get on the metro and you see this? This is interesting, you know? One person. In uh, you know, us and Elsa or something, dressed as a panda, yeah, whatever. 20 people, 50 people, you want to track your errors the same way. You want to say, well, okay, we normally get one or two. Suddenly we've got 100. What's the problem? Something is going on. No one's noticed yet because our software is recovering, but that recovery comes at a cost. Info is everything's fine. System is up. It's all good. The reason why we track info messages, say you go home for a long weekend. You come in after three days, Tuesday morning. You're like, hey, how did it go? How was the system over the weekend? Everyone says, it's brilliant. Nothing. No errors, no warnings, no failures, no alerts. Actually, there's nothing at all. There's no, no, no activity. And you think, OK, either we actually had a perfect weekend, or all of the logging systems fell over on Friday and nobody noticed. Which one do you think is more likely? Yeah? Info messages, are you going, no, it was actually up. Look, we're refreshing the cache every 10 minutes, and here we're pulling fresh exchange rates every four hours, and we just had a really good weekend. Info is your kind of safety net. It says, yes, the logs are working, the information's going. You know, relax, go and grab a coffee. Then there's debug. Now, debug, one of the best habits, I think, that we can all get into as engineers is the second you start doing console.log or you know, response.write or uh, you know, any of these um, things, your console.write line, install a logging framework and start using debug for those instead. Because debug will print to the screen. It does exactly the same job. But then you can leave it in, and when you ship to production, you can switch it off. And the question is, you know, do you log all the things? Yeah, all the stuff that's useful when you are building the system, all the stuff which was important enough that you were like, I want to put this on my screen right now, leave that in. Use debug logging for it. You're going to get a lot of traffic. You're going to switch it off. But one day, you're going to get a problem which only happens on production at 3 o'clock on a Sunday morning. It doesn't happen on dev, doesn't happen on staging, can't replicate it locally. It never happens during the day. And at that point, you can go onto production, you can change the XML, and you can switch the debug logging back on. And you can see every single thing, method entries, parameter values, serialization, all this kind of stuff. 
And that's the thing that's going to be like, OK, now we can work with this. Now we actually have some context for it. Now, the thing about all of these logging levels, the reason they're so confusing is they called them the wrong thing. All right, Fatal error, yeah, whatever. What they should have done is given them names which actually say what it is you want them to do. Log.fatal? Nah. Log error? No. Skaji probachte istvori ticket vajira. It's what you wanted to do. Skaji many? Yakcho se stanetsia, tis yakcho raviz. Raziv. Info? Se normalno. System pratsuye. And finally, log debug, because people always forget about this. Zapovni mi disksi stack tresyami. Because that's what it does. So there you go. Let's recap the rules of happy code. Number one, remember names. Naming things is such a simple way of making software discoverable. Give things names, use the names. Use them in PagerDuty. Use them in your log files and your wiki and your repository. It will start allowing you to see software as a bunch of characters and interactions instead of just 150,000 lines of code and no one knows what it does, and everything is called the system, except the bit that's called the database. Learning curves. Steep is fine. Shallow is fine. Remember the owl. Don't write documentation that says, simply install the component, because the person reading it, it's not simple for them. It might be really, really complex. They may never have worked on this before. You know, Pay attention to the steps. If you're maintaining systems and you've got new people, everybody who joins your team is an opportunity for you to sit with them. Don't help watch them. See the points where they get stuck and say, right, I'm going to update the documentation. You go and grab a cup of coffee. Then we're going to try this again, and we're going to see if my documentation helped you. And that way, you improve the experience for you, for them, and for everybody you're working with. When you write error messages, put in as much detail as you can. Don't be scared of, you know, your users here are developers. You're creating user experiences. Put the stack trace in the error message. Put the serialization error in the error message. Don't ever do the operation could not be completed, unspecified error. Or even worse, the operation could not be completed. The error was the operation completed successfully, which I've had from Visual Studio a couple of times. <laughs> Signposting. There are points in these journeys, APIs, databases, where you can say to your user, look, there's like four different things that are, make sense from here. This is what they are. Click this, click this, try them. Create sandboxes, let people explore. Take the covers off things. Put the engines and the algorithms where you can get in and look at them. You know, Watch how systems behave in real time. Software is not code in a repository. Software is a living, dynamic thing that is running out there in the cloud or in your data center. If you can't watch it when it's alive, you have no idea how it's actually going to behave. Reading code will only get you so far. And the golden rule to rule them all is all of us are creating user experiences all the time. It doesn't matter what you're building. Databases, back end, front end, somebody is going to be using your code. They are your user. It is up to you whether that person is going to have a bad day or they're going to get loads of stuff done. They're going to go home really happy with a smile on their face and come back tomorrow ready to do some more. Thank you. Jakuyu. you.